<laughs> you're yeah you, you were just breaking up there you were working great earlier but that what you just said broke up so i don't know okay, let me put my earbuds in And while she's doing that, just uh, remember, you can ask questions at any time. So if you want to put something in the Q&A feature now, um, you'll be at the top of the queue um, earlier. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that better? Is that better? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we can get started. Let me make sure I'm doing this. Actually, let me, let me, let me go this route. Can everyone see that? No, you have to hit the share button, the green share button down at the bottom of your screen. Okay, let me get out of this really quick. Thanks for everyone's no. patience. So we did this earlier and it's so funny how, now that it's time, <laughs> there's a hiccup, but it always works out. Okay, great. So can you see that? Can everybody see that hopefully? Yeah. Okay, so I am Candace Christiansen. I am located in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I absolutely love Rob and Tammy. I've known them for quite some time and I'm just honored to be here with you tonight. I, as Scott said, own an outtra outpatient treatment center. I'm a certified sex addiction therapist and certified EMDR trauma expert. Um, and that's a couple of the many hats I wear. But one of my expertise is working with men and women who have love addiction. And so I'm really excited tonight to talk with you about understanding love addiction because I think it's really misunderstood. So let's go ahead and jump right in. A lot of people don't know what love addiction is. And so we're going to talk about some primary characteristics of love addiction. And this is adapted from Pia Melody's book, Facing Love Addiction. And I will just, I'll talk more about her book and as well as Prodependence, Rob's book. And for those of you that are looking for some resources about this, the primary characteristics of a love addict are first and foremost, placing an inordinate amount of time, attention. Let me just move if I, I don't know that I can move it. Let me see if I can move my, I see my screen kind of covering it. Um, so time, attention, energy, focus on one person, specifically one's partner. Uh, this can include feeling obsessed about the other person, what they're doing, what they're thinking, how they're feeling. So being so focused and obsessed that it really interferes with what you as a love addict are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and even moment to moment. Um, neglecting your own needs and wants for the other person in the relationship at your own expense. So when we're working with someone, when I'm working with someone that has love addiction, this is, this is not just I love this person and I care about them. This is I love and care about this person so much that it's more than I care about myself. I would do anything for this person at my own expense. And so when men or women are coming into our program, we see this a lot where it's damaging to uh, your personhood, literally your self-esteem, your self-care. There's a lot of deprivation that can show up when love addiction's involved. Um, it can be really damaging. So is love addiction the same as codependency? You know, I think this is a great question because people think, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a love addict. Isn't that just that I'm codependent on another person? And while the answer is no, my, my response a lot of times has been love addiction is like codependency on steroids. But as I've evolved through the years and we do that, uh, you know, I've, yeah, we do that as therapists, we evolve. There really, there, there are some real significant differences with between love addiction and codependency. So really, if we look at codependent and that term, and Rob talks about this in his new book, Prodependence, it's historically used to define um, someone or describe a loved one of an alcoholic or a substance abuse addict. So someone that cares so much, again, for the addict or alcoholic um, 
and focuses on them, enabling them with poor boundaries. And historically, codependency, again, this is adapted from PMility, um, is defined as difficulty with self-esteem and loving yourself, difficulty setting boundaries and protecting yourself, difficulty with your own identity and your own reality. So really struggling with who I am as my own person because I am so focused on making sure that, um, you know, this addict or alcoholic that I love, it, and again, we can now generalize that to different addictions, right? So process addictions, a sex addict that I'm in love with, making sure that they get to work on time, they don't lose their job, they're waking up, did they pay the bills? Uh, finding that we're doing things for them, really stepping in and stepping up when they're falling short. And, and again, a difficulty addressing your own needs and wants, as well as being appropriate as it pertains to your age. I'll talk a little bit more about that last statement momentarily. Um, I'm going to challenge the term codependent here for a minute, okay? And I, and this is something that I will say, and I'm promoting Rob's book, Prodependence. I messaged him and just said, love your work. I think he's a brilliant author. He writes with such clarity and makes it really easy for the reader to understand. But really the challenge I have with the term codependency, and I think a lot of times when we talk about addiction is it's very pathologizing. And I'll say this, I think historically what happens, especially for partners of addicts, is that caregivers get pathologized. And so they'll walk into treatment and the, the labels of you're immature, you're sick, you're just as sick as the addict, you're part of the problem are slapped onto the partner or the caregiver, which can be a real turnoff for a person seeking treatment or support. It's very similar when we're looking at someone with love addiction. One of the things that I really struggle with with Pia Melody's book, Facing Love Addiction, is her first chapter is pretty pathologizing, perhaps unintentionally, in talking about the difference between a codependent and a love addict, but the themes surrounding both are pretty negative. So talking about Again, how immature and sick the individual, the partner, the caregiver is. And so, again, I, um, I don't, Rob actually doesn't know that I'm promoting him as much as I am, but I, you know, his pro dependence book, if you are wanting to understand love addiction and codependency from a pro dependency standpoint, is really beautiful because someone that is love addicted, and I'll go to here. If we look at love addiction, similar to codependency, we're looking at childhood wounds and childhood trauma a lot of times. And so, you know, a love addict has a history of being abandoned emotionally and or physically by their primary caregiver. Now, this is different from a love avoidant. And for those of you that may not have heard of the term love avoidant, P. Melody does actually talk about that in her book. A love avoidant was smothered or enmeshed when they were growing up. And what's really interesting for those of you listening, a lot of times, and I see this with sex addicts and their partners, the sex addict will show up as love avoidant in their relationship. And the partner will oftentimes show up as addicted to their partner, to the relationship to their person, and that can create a lot of uh, turmoil within the relationship, a lot of push-pull dynamics, and a lot of struggle. With folks who have love addiction, what I'll also see is a preoccupied attachment style, uh, whereas someone, for instance, that's love avoidant may have more of an anxious avoidant attachment style where there's more of an attach release going on. So preoccupied would be, you know, when you're little and a securely attached child, and there's a lot of research on this, and Rob actually talks about this in his Prodependence book, where Bowlby did research on attachment styles. A securely attached child can be happy and easygoing, mom's in the room, mom leaves the room, 
they feel safe and secure to play. They might look around, they're eager to have mom come back, but they know that mom, their object is going to come back, secure attachment. With someone that's ha that has a preoccupied attachment style, oftentimes there's this sense of they're gone forever. And so when parent comes back in the room, there's a lot of clinging and neediness uh, and needing of reassurance that sadly, uh, children that have preoccupied attachment, they don't get that reassurance because there's so much inconsistency in the relationship. And so when I work with folks that have love addiction, when we go back into their childhood, we'll see that the dynamics in their relationship between parent and child were very inconsistent to where they felt very unsafe and very, there are very specific situations in their childhood or upbringing where they did feel abandoned and left. And so the fascinating thing with a love addict is that they have this conscious fear of being abandoned again. And so that's why there tends to be this sense of I have to cling or I want to control. Uh, but an, the unconscious fear really is actual intimacy. And so why that is, is because oftentimes an individual who has love addiction, don't, they don't really have a healthy foundation or a relationship template that explains a healthy relationship where there's a secure attachment. And so once they get in that type of relationship, it's very foreign. And so we do a lot of work around that, which is my next slide, where in recovery to work with them on attaching in a healthy way. So I have a lot of compassion for folks that have love addiction, part one reason I'm a recovering love addict, so I understand that quite well. Um, and also in my work with folks that have love addiction, and again, it's not just women or men, um, men and women can have love addiction as well as love avoidance. Um, you know, my work is to really have that compassionate support and understanding that this is something that, yeah, may have come from childhood. And yeah, there might be some, some behaviors that you're doing that aren't the healthiest for you because you're noticing them and you're coming to get support for it. But your intentions are good and we can work with you on that. So treatment, um, you know, individual treatment, couples therapy is really good for this too, looking at an individual that has love addiction, an individual that has love avoidance, really working with them on healthy attachment. Uh, what we do though is in individual therapy, we look at internal family systems model. And so really there, every one of us has parts and that's what this is really talking about where we each have parts inside of us, you know, that little girl who felt abandoned might get triggered at times in her adult relationship and find that she gets really angry or anxious when her partner travels a lot. And so finding ways to self parent that little girl, but also teaching ways to ask for what you need appropriately in your relationship and be able to get those needs met in a healthy way so that your partner can be receptive of that. We uh, in Namaste do a lot of eye movement desensitization reprocessing. It's a trauma therapy known as EMDR, very research-based um, or, or other. There are other forms of trauma therapy. The internal family systems model is one, but there's biofeedback, neurofeedback. There's so many good EFT um, forms of trauma therapy. You know, how we grow up is really how we show up. And so we've got to go back and really help our nervous system calm down, but also change those neural pathways uh, so that we can have secure attachments and connection. You're hearing me say that a lot, attachment. This is an attachment-based addiction, just like we see with so many addictions, sex addiction being one. It can also be very dissociative and trauma-based. And so being really mindful that we've got to go back and offer support in those areas as well. You know, that's my third point, right? So teaching healthy forms of attachment, starting with the therapist as the helper in the room, really creating that safety and support and avoiding pathologizing 
the, the individual that's in, in front of me. I know that's really important to me, but having a lot of compassion it takes a lot of courage to show up in my office. And so just really wanting to be supportive of that and what you're going through. And then along with that, really looking at how can we teach self-care? You know, how can I care for me? How can I love myself while I love you? How can I love you, but not at my own expense? What are the signs and symptoms of that? What might trigger me to step out of myself and move over into your, uh, your, your lane or your yard, your side of the street? And how can I be mindful of my side of the street? Um, we work on needs and wants development because so many individuals grew up not being able to ask or have needs. And so really helping clients understand that you are worthwhile, that you have wants, needs, and desires that are valuable, and it's okay to ask for those needs to be met. It's okay to meet your own needs and offer yourself at support and get support from other people, including your partner. And then how can you work to be interdependent in your relationship, in your coupleship? Um, how can that look? How can you go from being anxiously attached or pre preoccupied in your attachment style to being really securely attached? And it's definitely possible with consistent practice and support. So those are my brief slides. I wanted to keep it brief so we could open it up for some questions and answer time. I'll pass it to Scott. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Candace, for that great presentation. If you could okay. stop sharing your screen. Yep, I will do that. <laughs> anyway, um, in the interim, uh, I wanna remind everybody, uh, this is a webinar for you where you can ask questions about anything. Um, it doesn't have to just be love addiction, which, which Candace just talked about. It can be anything. Um, so use the Q&A feature to ask questions. I will get us started real quick. Um, you talked about um, sex addicts tend to be, sex addicts tend to be love avoidant, whereas love addicts tend to kind of be the opposite, but both are really avoiding intimacy. Um, can, you, can you explain the avoidance of intimacy and why people avoid intimacy? I mean, I, I know you talked a little bit about trauma, but maybe in a little more detail. Sure, so if we talk about, let's talk about love avoidance for a, a minute because love avoidance actually, again, they really want intimacy. Like you said, both the love addict, the love avoidant want intimacy, but the love avoidant actually seeks intensity outside of the relationship because it can be pretty scary to get your needs met inside the relationship. If we look at non-consciously, a lot of times love avoidance as children were very smothered and enmeshed. If, um, you know, I know John Taylor does webinars and um, some groups on here too. And he also does mother and mesh, works with um, men and women with mother and meshment issues. And so when you come from a space of being enmeshed, being in relationship with one person who has needs, when you had to put your needs aside, and that is all you know can be really, really scary, which can cause you to, to push that person away because you don't know how to ask for what you need. Uh, you grow up not asking for what you needed or not being able to because you're caring for someone else and focusing on them, you're also smothered. So being in a relationship then with a person who has needs, let alone a love addict who comes across as very needy, and I say that with, with so much love and compassion, can be really hard and foreign. But then we have the side of the love addict, right? So the love addict grows up having all of this abandonment and then falling in love with this person who is constantly leaving the relationship to seek intensity outside. Well, the interesting thing about the love addict is they create this fantasy world in the beginning of their relationship because they grew up where it wasn't a fantasy. A lot of times it was a nightmare. And so they create this fantasy as an adult of this is what I want. You know, my prince or princess, charming. And so, but then the walls start to crumble. The castle starts to crumble when the love avoidant continues to not show up, continues to disappoint. And then the love, at, the love addict gets sick and tired of being sick and tired of their, their partner and says, I'm done, that's it. 
And then guess what? You know, I've had it. I, I want intimacy. I'm not getting it. I'm going to end the relationship. And what happens is the love avoidant then le leans in out of fear of being left. So it's this dance. So hopefully I answered that. There's definitely a dance going on um, where both people want intimacy. They just don't know how. And so oftentimes they act very non-consciously based on childhood wounds. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's, we've got a question in from uh, one of our attendees. Um, what, is the diff what is different about love addicts, and love addicts and sex addicts and what's the same? So what are the similarities and differences? Okay. So a love addict is addicted to the person in the relationship. When I work with someone who has sex addiction, this is all about um, numbing out through sex or sexual means. Okay. Now it's not about sex. That's what's interesting. Sex addiction is not about sex. We know in the research, it's a dissociative disorder. We know it's a brain disease. Uh, we know it's based on trauma in one's past. There's a lot of numbing that goes on, a lot of negative core beliefs from childhood. But the person with the sex addict is compulsively acting out through sexual means, okay? So whether that's one night stands, whether that's sex chatting, um, compulsively looking at pornography, uh, compulsively masturbating at all levels, I've seen all levels. The love addict may may use sex to, to um, secure that they're loved. I've seen that with a lot of women where it's like, yeah, I had sex with him because I thought I was securing love, but there's a lot of difference there. I've also seen love addicts where they might be sexually anorexic, so they don't actually want sex, but they are obsessed with this person in the one relationship. And so sometimes they'll say, yeah, I Facebook stalked my partner, you know, because I want to know their every move or I check their phone all the time because I want to know their every move. I am literally addicted to time, place, this person, how they are, who they are. And so it's a compulsive behavior towards a person, not necessarily a sexual act, if that makes sense, as a form of numbing. So um, there are the differences there can be, like I said, some similarities where it looks like, you know, for a, a female, for instance, I, I'm thinking of, I work with a lot of females who have love addiction, where they'll say, I am obsessed with this person. So even though I don't want to have sex or I hate sex, I will have sex because I want them to give me their time and attention and meet my needs. And so even if I don't want to have sex or I feel obligated, I'm going to do that because as a result, they're going to show up for me and I literally need their love to survive. So it feels very addictive to the person rather than, you know, sex chatting, um, webcams, mutual masturbation, one night stands, those types of things to get needs met. I, I would add to that, that, um, both sex addicts and love addicts have incredibly unrealistic expectations of what they're going to get out of whatever encounter they're 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 seeking. I mean, sex addicts always think it's going to be the greatest sex ever. It never is. Love addicts always think it's going to be the perfect relationship. It never is. There is no such thing. Yeah, I love that you said that. That so that definitely speaks to the fantasy that I was talking about. That there is this this fantasy out there of this relationship is going to be this ideal perfect thing for the love addict or this next high with sex, you know, 100% dopamine when you orgasm, this next high is going to be the ticket, right? And so that's why we actually see with sex addiction, people often will escalate into a uh, more riskier behavior. And that's a whole other program that I offer where they, they may cross over. For instance, a porn addict may actually become escalate to where now they're looking at child sexual abuse images. So it might escalate in that realm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. We've got a couple more questions here. Um, this one says, okay, I exhibit the behaviors of a love addict, but I had a very healthy upbringing and relationship with parents. I was sexually molested one time by a babysitter when I was five years old, though. Could that traumatizing experience be connected to my current sex and love addiction? I'm a hetero woman, by the way. 
Okay, so first I wanna thank you for asking that question. And I have worked with people who have healthy childhood, you know, healthy upbringings, and who end up finding that they are, um, you said sex and love addicted, but you said we folks were focusing on love addiction, who feel like they tend to get addicted. And so here's what I would look at. Um, just something for you to consider, birth order, where, you know, birth order, unless you were an only child. So that also could be interesting. Who were you close to, mom or dad? What was your relationship like with them? Where, did you feel securely attached? What were your relationships like um, in elementary school, in junior high, in high school? Yes, being molested, even if one time can be completely traumatizing to the nervous system. Um, and it can also create different messages about relationships, right? And what is um, our value? And so um, I'll speak as a childhood sexual abuse survivor. Um, I speak about it. I've written a book about it. Um, it warps your whole system about relationships and who you are in relationship. Uh, because your body, again, if you're uh, when we're sexually abused, the idea is, okay, that's what's important, right? And so that can definitely skew our belief about relationship and then love, right? So what does sex represent? I would ask yourself that. What does love represent? I would ask yourself that. Um, I also don't know you and I would need to do a full assessment to see, you know, to tease out what else it, there could be. Um, but those are just some of my initial thoughts. Candace, could you talk a little bit about, I mean, there's a lot of research that shows, uh, particularly with childhood sexual trauma, how the family handles it, if they handle it, um, can affect the long-term, you know, prognosis for healing and, 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 and things. So, yeah, so I think there's so many factors that go into how someone recovers from childhood sexual abuse. I think definitely if you have the protective factors of one or both parents that are safe or caregivers that are safe, that are willing to acknowledge what happened and to create safety around that. And I'm saying this as if it's someone even outside the relationship, even if there could be, it could be a parent or a sibling, but there's got to be a safe private caregiver uh, protective factor inside the home that acknowledges and creates safety so that there can be healing at a young age. Um, yes, that can be essential to one's recovery. And, and I the did not lack of that can, can, I mean, research shows it can actually be more traumatic than the traumatic event. Yes. Yeah, so, so or, it can add to, it can absolutely add to trauma. So there's also, it, it can add insult to injury, if you will. So there's been an incredible injury um, on a person's being from being sexually abused, right? And so having being blamed by primary caregivers, family support, having it not be acknowledged, having it continue can be so incredibly damaging to the person. Um, I will say this, and again, part of my story is my dad was safe, my mom was not. This is in my, in my book, so I do talk about this. Mom was an alcoholic, mom was not safe. Dad was my safe person. I don't know that I would be where I am had I not had my dad as or other support. My dad was really essential in getting me therapy as a child. My mom was non-existent in that regard because of her alcoholism and her other stuff. And so, you know, had both of them turned their backs, I really believe my trajectory would be different. And so I love that if Scott, you asked that, I love that you asked that, whoever asked that, if not Scott, thank you for asking that because, and talking about, the, giving me the opportunity to talk about that, what happens afterwards is so incredibly essential. And there's always hope. We, I want you to know there's always hope. You could literally grow up with no support and feel so incredibly traumatized. And I promise you, you can still heal, even if you're 60 years old, with the proper support and the proper therapy. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Candace. We've got a whole bunch of questions coming in now. Oh, um, <laughs> my husband has never worked a 12-step program, even though he has been a porn addict since he was 16. He is now almost 70. Uh, he was horribly enmeshed by his mother for years. I believe he is anxious avoidant. He has had years of ongoing therapy, general counseling for his depression, some therapy around his addiction, but he has never been completely honest, minimizing his involvement, denying his behaviors, etc. cetera. Uh, I tried a couple of meetings, said they were a waste because there was no interaction. Um, he's still lying to me and hiding his relapses. I am insisting he get into a program with no luck. I am ready to divorce him after 38 years. Please comment. <laughs> Okay, so my heart goes out to you uh, because what a struggle, right? And so, and I, I um, first, what a lot of courage for you to stay in this long and to love him the way that you've loved him. So, and kudos to you for being on the call tonight and kudos to you for being aware of, I don't know that I can continue to do this. There are so many resources out there. Vicki Tidwell Palmer is one of my favorites. She just, VickiTidwellPalmer.com, okay? Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R. She has a podcast for partners. She has Moving Beyond Betrayal, her book, which is a five-step boundary process that can give you support. Uh, this is really about you at this point in time. You have given it your all. You have offered him the support. Here's resources, try this, do this. And the ball is really in his court. It is okay to still love him through it. And um, thank you for typing that. It is okay to still love him. And I really think healthy boundaries can be about, I love you and I love me. Um, and this is what I'm doing because I love you and I love me. And these are the boundaries. And so that would be my encouragement to you is get yourself, if he's not willing to, okay, that is very painful. I get it. I understand that. It is okay for you to still get the support you need. And that's, that's the next step that I would take is getting that support that you need so you can make those decisions. If you're saying, I'm done, you may feel done today, but then you may see a little light at the end of the tunnel tomorrow and say, okay, I'm not done. Okay, that's okay. Get yourself those resources so at least you can strengthen your boundaries and figure out what you need. Thanks for, thanks for commenting. Okay. Um, my SA sex addicted husband does not seem to have been enmeshed or abandoned large, loving, mostly healthy family. What could have caused him to become this way? Yeah, he went to hookers with new, loving, attractive, trusting, attentive wife at home. Um, what makes someone act out sexually when they're not trying to numb any trauma? These are loaded questions because unless you're really in front of me and I'm doing a full assessment, it is definitely hard to take kind of a throw the dart and let me guess. What I will say is, I'll speak in general terms. When I work with anyone, their behavior, so for instance, paying for an escort, paying for a prostitute, what that tells me is the person, and I see this all the time, does not have enough self-esteem, number one. I, I'm going to pay for you to love me and give me attention for this amount of time. So I'm buying my value because I don't feel valued. So someone can grow up and be void of having the tra trauma, by the way, shame can be traumatizing, and we all have shame. So when I say trauma, people automatically think sex abuse. No, shame can be traumatizing, and it can traumatize the system. So if your husband in any way felt shame, I'm bad, is shame, he may not feel valued, so I'm going to buy my value. Another thing is it's transactional. So if, if I feel really anxious in my relationships, I don't feel good enough, I still want to get those affirmations and attention. I'm just going to buy this transaction so that at least I get that and I feel that. So the, there needs to be work around that. And I, I can, I'm sure you are loving and supportive and this is not about you. He definitely needs to figure that out. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people act out and there are very specific reasons that I'm able to identify when I work with people. Let me give an example too. Um, exhibitionist. Every single person I've worked with that has exposed themselves, whether it was a stripper, whether it was someone who flashes their genitals in public, was bullied as a child. Every single one of them. 
What does that mean? Being involuntarily exploited as a child, whether it's by a parent, a sibling, or a peer, impacts the person to the point where those individuals who end up exposing themselves, they voluntarily exploit now because they are trying to master that trauma. So that's just another example. Um, just another example. So lots of good questions, lots of loaded questions. I, I would also add that trauma is highly subjective. Um, what's yes. traumatic for you might not be yes. for me. If I'm a race car driver and I have a fender bender, whatever. Yes. But if I'm a new mother with my baby in the back seat and I have a fender bender. Mm -hmm. It's an entirely different experience. So, absolutely, a childhood can look good. It might, it might be, it might drive a lot of shame. I mean, can yes, shame, and that's the matter. yes. Yes, and I do want to say this because I, while I have worked with people that said, hey, I really had nothing in my childhood, when we get down to it, folks, there's stuff. There is stuff in everyone's childhood. Nobody grows up unscathed, and I will actually hold my thumb to it. You can have whoever wants to reach out and challenge me on that. I would love to talk with you. Nobody, nobody grows up unscathed because shame is traumatizing and Brene Brown says it. We all have shame. Okay. Totally agree. Um, do love addicts and sex addicts typically attract each other? <laughs> I've seen that before. <laughs> I've definitely seen that before. Here's what's interesting. This is what I was saying about the love avoidant. So a sex addict oftentimes in my work with folks will be love avoidant in the relationship with the love addict. So the addict is going this way, the avoidant is going this way. You know, come give me my needs. No, 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 I'm going out here. So there's this going on. I'm chasing you, says the love addict. I'm going out here to get my needs met, you know, says the sex addict through this intensity because I don't feel like you're good enough for me. I have you on a pedestal partner. Um, I, I believe I'm a bad and worthy person. Dr. Cards talks about this in Out of the Shadows. Um, I believe that if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me. A lot of partners are put on a pedestal. They're put in a china cabinet. And so because the sex addict doesn't feel good enough um, for their partner, who oftentimes does have symptoms of love addiction, but sometimes not, sometimes not, um, they're, they're, I've got to get my needs met is the, the justification and the thinking error. So they go outside with a stranger or whatever, someone who doesn't matter to get their needs met. It doesn't make any sense to a logical person, but it is definitely a form of coping. Um, next one here. Um, oh, this is um, from the woman who's, who was molested at five. Um, she says she did not speak of that until she was 19 years old. It happened when she was five, too little, too late. Um, she says her family was supportive when she did disclose, but she didn't disclose for 14 years, for her entire childhood. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. I, um, your, her family was supportive. Yeah, when she, when when she came, when she mm -hmm. talked about it at age 19, yes. Yeah, which is a blessing. And, you know, one of the things I'll just say is I can only imagine for here's a lot. Here's the thing. Um, sometimes people don't actually remember a lot of details until they're older. It sounds like in your situation, you you knew of it and remembered and didn't feel safe or comfortable or for whatever reason to bring it out. And that's okay. The important thing is that you did. And thank goodness you got the support of your family. Um, my hope now is that you are being gentle and loving on yourself and going back to that little five-year-old inside of you to give her that um, love and support that she needs to know that she didn't do anything wrong and that you're here and you're showing up for her and you're making sure that she feels safe so that you now can also have um, just live the wholehearted life that you deserve. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a question from a male, um, or at least the name is male. I'm married to a sex addict that is in recovery, but I'm scared to death that our three kids are going to, this might be from the wife, I don't know. Um, I'm scared to death that our three kids are going to see our marriage and think this is what a marriage should look like. They are four, seven, and 13. Hmm. How much should we talk to them about this problem so they know better? 
Okay. So Mending a Shattered Heart is edited by Stephanie Carnes, Mending a Shattered Heart. There are certain chapters that I wouldn't recommend, but the chapters uh, that talk about disclosure to children are great, great guide for you. So I would definitely look at that because there are different, um, you know, as experts in treating sex addiction, we say this in the CSAT world, really, we're looking at different developmental stages. So what you tell to your teenager is definitely going to be different than what you tell to your five-year-old. And so the, I would get that book, at, um, at, look at that chapter offers a great guide for what do I say and when do I say and how do I say it. Thanks for asking that. But say it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And demonstrate, right? In recovery, you can do reparative work to demonstrate that we can get through challenging times, right? There can be corrective experiences that your kids see. We want kids to see conflict. We want them to see corrective experiences with conflict. Because I have worked with clients who said, I never saw one conflict between my parents I grew up not being able to regulate, especially when kids at school were mean. I literally didn't know how to regulate, so I started to compulsively masturbate or act out sexually to deal and soothe with those symptoms, or I started drinking too much, or I started smoking pot, you know, chronic pot smoker, or using other substances because I didn't know how to deal with my dysregulation. Yeah, about every, kids need their parents to talk to them about everything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because that's how kids learn and, and that's how kids learn that it's okay to not be perfect and to be confused and, and it's okay. Um, and especially sexual issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in my house, nobody talked about sex. Sex was dirty. Mm -hmm. um, and when I complained uh, about certain things that were happening, uh, I got laughed at and told I was being too sensitive and there was no discussion. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a lot of kid friendly books. If you're talking about like, you know, what are safe pictures and being safe online, I would check. You can literally go on Amazon and look for those. I think I don't want to say if it's good pictures, bad pictures. And I know that might, but I think there actually is a book called that where they talk about, yeah, say what's safe, what's not online. There's so many resources out there nowadays to guide you, but um, Mending is a really great book for that, knowing what to say when. And I love how Scott said that. Great reminder to make sure you do talk about it. Let's not make sex taboo. You know, Dr. Kern says um, this quote that's just, it's laughable, but it's true. You know, sex is dirty. Save it for someone you love. And that's what a lot of people are taught, right? It's dirty, but oh, let's just wait till you're married, then it's okay. Very confusing for people. And so, especially when we add in compulsion, can create so much confusion. Kids feel it, they sense that something's going on in the, your marriage. So it is definitely important to talk about. It's just how and when. Yeah. Um, next question here. Uh, I fall under the love avoidance category. Um, okay. re recently sought help for porn and alcohol addiction. Hmm. Um, the person in my life is beyond hurt and angry with my lack of empathy slash emotion. Hmm. I'm really sorry and regretful over my actions, but I can't show it appropriately. I turn to anger as a defense when confronted with emotion, which I know is wrong, but I cannot yet break that reaction. Where do I start? At? You know, he wants, or he or she wants to break through the fearful numbness um, and wants mm. to not start. Okay, so first my hope is, I hope you said this, that you're in therapy and you're doing some work around it. Get P. Melody's Facing Love Addiction book and look at the section on love avoidance because it's going to walk you through that interaction with your partner. Step number one that you just said is awareness. The fact that you are aware of what you're doing is key because with awareness comes choice. We have choice. Now you can make change. You have an opportunity to do that. So really, really important there. I also want to say kudos to you for saying, how do I break through the fear and the numbness? So what, what's next? And my hope is you do this in therapy is what part of you is afraid what part of you wants to numb? Typically the part that's afraid is a younger part of you. And why is that part afraid? There's a protector part, which is often older that's saying, shh, I'll help you numb out. I'll help you feel better. We got this. So starting to become aware 
of your parts inside, um, going back to your childhood, doing a timeline, what was going on in my childhood, you know, where did this start, how did this start, um, but not just where did the porn start, right? How, how did I cope as a kid? When I, I ask every person I work with, did you daydream as a child? Did you check out as a child, right? Because porn is the adult version of daydreaming. It's the adult form of daydreaming. You're going into a fantasy world. It's not real. And so a lot of people numb out because they don't know how to deal with their emotions. When did that start for you? Were you around a family member that was angry, anxious, similar to what partner's doing that caused you to not know how to, to deal with your emotions? Or were you in a family where someone was really angry if emotions were shown, so you learned to shut them off or you learned that anger was the way to solve your problems? Really good time for you to explore your past. Good luck with that. Um, that was a great question. Um, what are some general tools to use uh, trying to get off the, the edge of the cliff of a fantasy and to start seeing another person for who he or she really is? So fantasy, when we look at fantasy, um, it depends on how far down the road you are with fantasy. But if you're in the beginning of it, you know, we talk about the three second rule in treatment, which is, you know, you look at the person, if this is if you're looking at a real person, you look at them, you acknowledge they're a person, this is someone's daughter, this is someone's wife or child, so on and so forth, you look, acknowledge, wow, they're beautiful, and then you look away and you don't look back, it's not a waltz. If you are online just looking at anything, there's so much out there that can create fantasy, You've got to uh, behaviorally get yourself out of that. Now, that can be really hard if you're online and you're not tuned in. So it's really important to be tuned in. What am I doing while I'm looking at this? Click out of it, whether it's, wow, I'm on Facebook, you know, click out of it and then get up, distract yourself for a minute, go get a drink of water. Wow, okay, take some deep breaths. Again, that's right out of the gate really, really quickly. Um, that's, yeah, being on a webinar this fast, that's all I could say was really, really quickly. We would, in therapy, obviously do work around the fantasy. Yeah, I would, I would add that um, for the first, I'm a recovering sex addict, for the first several years of my recovery, I carried a list of healthy other activities. And I could pull awesome. it out of my pocket and go, oh, I can, you know, I need to go to the grocery store. I, I need to, you know, I can read a book. I call a friend. I can do... Um, you know, addiction for me and for everyone I've ever talked to who's an addict is, it's like a boulder at the top of the hill and it rocks a little bit yeah. and it tips. And if you catch it before it tips, you've got a chance. If you don't, that sucker's going to roll and you're screwed. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so before it starts to roll, you're intervening by pulling out your list, right, Scott? You pull out yeah. your list and you go, what can I do instead? So behaviorally, I love that. And we were, I said that too, behaviorally, you're creating that distraction, right? So get your brain thinking about something new, moves it over into a new neural pathway. We're creating new groups. Oh, this is the fantasy creating new groups. This is hard stuff. So get support. It's hard. It is hard. The more connected you are to people in recovery, the easier that will be because Absolutely. you have more accountability. Um, Absolutely. Next question. My sex addicted husband had multiple online affairs and still lies and keeps secrets. Is that mm. love avoidance? Hmm. I, that, so that is too hard to know without doing a full assessment of him. Um, what I would say is it's huge betrayal to you and it's unfair to you, regardless of whether or not it's love avoidance. Um, I would need to know a little bit more. What I do know of folks that, and I said this before, there's a lot of sex addicts that I work with who have love avoidance where, again, they seek intensity outside of the relationship because inside of the relationship, so they're pushing their partner away while seeking intensity outside the relationship. There are some that aren't actually love avoidant though. They might be a sex addict without love avoidance. They might be a sex and love addict. So I don't know. All I can say though is it's hurting you. It's definitely a betrayal. And my hope is that they would get further assessments so that they could see if that's what, what's going on. What, what are the reasons for why they're doing this? 
because it is damaging a relationship. Yeah, that answer actually leads us right into the next question. Um, you, you mentioned sex and love addicts. Um, is there some overlapping in sex addiction, love addiction, or is it one or the other? So there can be some, I've worked with people, they have SLAW, Sex and Love Addictions Anonymous, they have the SLAW book. Um, some people are love addicts, some people are sex addicts. Um, again, some people can be sex and love addicts where they're not just um, you know, acting out, numbing out through these maladaptive forms of sexual coping, but they also find that they are clinging to someone in the relationship. So whether that's their partner, um, by control, or they, you know, can't live without them. Um, a lot of times it could actually be with someone that they're acting out with, though, where they hone in on, so they're love avoided in the relationship, and then as they're acting out, they're honing in on someone to be addicted to if they've got sex and love addiction. Um, or, for instance, let's say someone has an affair, or they have chronic affairs, because one affair does not mean someone is a sex addict, that's, we're looking at compulsion, but let's say someone has has a chronic pattern of multiple affairs throughout the relationship and acting out and then they become very addicted to one one affair partner it can also show up that way too so yes there can be sex and love addiction together and it can also be very separate and I, I, see, all, I see all of those scenarios mm -hmm. in 12 step rooms all yep. the time. yeah um, so we're got about six minutes left. I've got two questions here. So we'll, we'll, do, we'll try and do them both. Uh, started off life in the Spockian era. I think that's Dr. Spock uh, yeah. from the book, not Dr. Spock from uh, yes. Spock. <laughs> um, my parents were told to let me cry it out and they put me on a strict, strict feeding schedule, um, which uh, this writer feels is repeated trauma. Uh, my mother was incapacitated with panic attacks. Dad was alcoholic, not much attachment at all. I checked out with books and bonded with nature as a kid. What are some of the best steps to build earned secure attachment now? Great question. Such a great question. If you have not read Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score, which is about this thick, it's huge, or listen to it on Audible's and you can do it in dosing, I would start there. It is incredibly validating of what you just described. Um, I'm just pausing because sometimes when I do these webinars, I will offer to send you my workbook. And so I realize there's a lot of people on the, on the call, not everyone takes me up on this, but if you would like a free copy of my workbook, Mastering the Trauma Wound, to work through some of this and, it's, and learn how, it's a mindful approach to healing trauma and um, creating healthier relationships. Scott, if there's a way that they can connect to me so I can send them my workbook, I would love to do that. If not, then go to my website, but um, I, I, yeah. Yeah, you can go to Candace's website or you can go to our website and contact us. Um, Fabulous. Tammy or Fabulous. me say, hey, I want Candace's workbook. Okay. Um, give us your name and address and, and I'll, I'll forward the emails to Candace. Yeah. And so there's another book that I really love and I'm all about books, but um, attached a book called attach, which we'll talk about attachment styles. So you just kind of understand, you know, what is my attachment style? There's also a podcast that I really love. It's called live awake. Um, and it's by Sarah Blondin. Uh, Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, B-L-O-N-D-I-N, phenomenal. So, you know, you're wanting to learn how to connect to people. This, it's just a very empowering way first to connect to yourself. Um, I love that you talked about use your connection to nature as a strength. And then I would also see if there's healthy things that you can get involved in, whether it's hiking, group meets that are healthy, where you can slowly start to do that. If that feels too scary, even doing online stuff like this, reaching out, um, joining a book club, something where you can slowly connect, where if you're scared, uh, you can use like, oh, I've got a book, basically is kind of the, the uh, format, which feels a little bit safer. Um, but that's what I would do, just again, educating what's my attachment style, so you're taking those little steps. And then also, what are some healthy ways that I can do activities? Taking a yoga class would be really great. Um, taking a meditation class would be really great, uh, where you 
um, you can start to connect to those around you that are like-minded, that would be really beautiful and a real slow way to get connected and be in your body and connect with others. Okay. Um, we've got time, it looks like, for one more. Uh, I'm a love addict. My girlfriend claims to really care about me but has sexual uh, only interactions with others, with random others. I talk to her about it, but she is pretty casual in her response. Am I foolish to continue with her? She would never look at her behavior as unusual. So he is a love addict. He has a girlfriend who is uh, having casual sex and uh, doesn't, she, seems, she thinks that's just fine. Uh, should he stay with her? Okay. So what I would say is, you know, in your heart and your gut, you know what, you know, ultimately what it feels like and what you want and what you need, and what you deserve. The challenge is you, you may love her, right? And so I don't want to say that you're a fool because again, that's pathologizing to you. I would love for you to work on what you want and what you need and what you deserve for you. And so this is where if she is not willing to change, she doesn't see an issue with it, you clearly have a problem with it, which is absolutely okay. I would have a problem with it. This is now a matter of you getting the support you need for you. Now, I did talk about Vicki Tidwell Palmer. She talks about boundaries. Male or female, get her book, Moving Beyond Betrayal. Look at her, her book on boundaries. That is really key for you so you can get strong and make those decisions in terms of what you need because you deserve that. You deserve to be in a relationship where someone, you know, you have the same values where, yeah, if that's what you want, you don't want to have an open relationship, it's, it should be okay for you to set that boundary and have her honor that. Thanks for asking. Yeah, open relationships can work, but only if both parties mutually agree without any sort of coercion, like, well, if you don't do this, I'll leave yes. you. That's yes. not agreeing. That's coercion. Or, yes, or I'm, or I'm going to agree because I, I don't want to lose my partner, and so I'm going to just do whatever they want. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, um, we've hit all our questions. Um, I put my email in the chat feature. Um, so anybody who wants to request the workbook from Candace, I'll, I'll take emails. It's scott at seekingintegrity.org, um, org, not com. Um, send me an email, or you can just, again, contact me through our website, sexandrelationshiphealing.com, or Candace's website, which is? Namasteadvice.com. Namasteadvice.com. Namaste is N-A-M-A-S-T-E advice. Advice, yep, A-D-V-I-C-E dot com. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you, Candice, for filling in while Rob is away in Singapore. He's doing some uh, training sessions for therapists uh, in Asia, which is very cool. Mm -hmm. um, very cool. No problem. Tammy's over there with him. So you got Candice and me today. Uh, Rob will be back next week. Um, Tammy will still be gone, so you'll get me with Rob next week. Um, so thank you, everybody. Please check out the website. Um, we've got lots of, we've got a fresh podcast up today on porn addiction, um, a couple of blogs up, uh, one of them's on body image, which is very cool. Um, so please check us out, and please check out Candace's site as well and her books. Thank okay. you so much, everybody. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much, Candace. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.